dear colleagues, uh, dear friends, uh, welcome to the Operation Seminar. So it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, who is uh, Katja Scheinberg. So Katja received uh, her PhD from the Moscow State University. And uh, then, in, yeah, some time ago, then she received her master uh, degree and PhD degree from Columbia University. And uh, she was for many years professor at the Lehigh University and moved two years ago to the Cornell University. So Katya is uh, yeah, working on, a, on many topics in optimization that she has a large expertise. And uh, she's also uh, serving our community as a editor in chief of uh, MOR. She's a co-editor of uh, Met Programming and uh, she's member of uh, editorial boards of very prestigious, prestigious optimization journals. So it is our, our great honor to have uh, Katya with us today. So Katya, you have 45 minutes for your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's um, a pleasure to do this. And, um, you know, the upside of all this um, uh, terrible pandemic is that it, it, I'm seeing some, you know, uh, old friends, like I, I see Philippe in, <laughs> actually I see his face, but the others I just see by name, but I see that you're there and it's great. Um, and really can't wait to see you in some conferences soon. So maybe at SIOP. Okay, so um, what I, I'll talk about today, many of you might have heard me talk about different aspects of the same work, uh, because this is something I've been doing with my colleagues for quite a few years. It's, it's in general just the, the kind of direction of uh, looking at complexity analysis of stochastic optimization, but very specific type of stochastic optimization. So uh, nevertheless, the audience here is a bit broad. I you know, obviously assume that you're all familiar with optimization, but not necessarily with this work. So I will try to kind of give an overview of what we've been doing. And thus we have, I have a lot of names of colleagues here on my slide because there's several papers, uh, well, quite a few papers by now that are addressing different aspects of the work that I'll present. Um, okay, so uh, what are we doing? Basically, we are minimizing uh, a, a, a you know, function that is assumed to be whatever smooth, however smooth we need it to be. So usually first or second order smooth. Um, and what we're interested in is kind of looking at the traditional uh, optimization algorithms such as line search, trust region, and cubically regularized Newton. I would argue that these are the three kind of key algorithms uh, that are used to optimizing f of x when there's no specific structure to f of x that we're trying to exploit. Um, and uh, when f is stochastic, however, the standard methods are not line search, trust region, and cubic regularized Newton. It's usually stochastic gradient descent and its variance. And we are kind of going to basically try to cross that boundary by applying these methods now to, to various versions of stochastic setting. Moreover, uh, not only stochastic, but uh, basically derivative free setting is also another setting where, you know, traditionally you try to use some different algorithms. Um, is specifically designed for these. And what we are gonna argue is that our analysis basically applies to um, you know, all these settings as long as you satisfy some conditions and how you satisfy these conditions that would define your specific algorithm. So the question is basically here, how can adaptive deterministic methods be used and analyzed for non-deterministic and possibly black box settings? Okay, so we will talk about what is what are the issues and, and how we resolve them? Uh, so here is the generic adapted deterministic method, which enc encompasses all three frameworks that I'm just I was just talking about. There's a lot of um, you know words here, but again, if you're familiar with these, you'll recognize immediately the key uh, steps. Uh, so first, you have initialization step, which picks some parameters. Uh, then this is the key thing: you choose a model that is good model of f around xk, the current iterate somehow, and then you compute a step using that model uh, that depends on the step size parameter, um, which we will be adjusting. 
things. So that step is the trial step that you're trying to take. And that step is meant to reduce the, fun the model value. So this uh, value of the model at the new point will be, of course, smaller than the original value. And uh, then you are actually going to compute the function value at this new point and see if you have comparatively, uh, so if reduction in the function is comparable to the reduction in the model. So you, you, you made some progress. And if you have made progress that is results in a successful iteration, I'll be using this terminology a lot. Uh, so successful iteration means you take a step and you increase the um, step size parameter, you're more aggressive. You want to take larger steps. Uh, otherwise, you don't take the step and you decrease the step size parameter and you continue. Okay, so the, the, there's a little bit of uh, so with line search, you don't necessarily put it in this framework exactly, usually, but you could put it in this framework. Uh, and so, indeed, this really encompasses all three standard methods. So, the line search, you are basically starting with this following uh, model. So, this model. If you're just doing gradient descent, uh, the H will be identity. Uh, there's an alpha parameter here. And so if you minimize this model, you will end up with this step. And then your condition on the sufficient decreases here. And it's a standard Armijo. You, you, you might be using Armijo and Wolf condition and things like that. Uh, the, the trust region method, you again minimize a quadratic model. Um, and typically, you have a gradient here and some approximation of the Hessian. And then um, you minimize it with the constraint on the uh, step size that is dictated by alpha k. Alpha k is now again a step size parameter, which is just the trust region radius. And there is a reduction uh, condition. And then uh, finally, cubically regularized Newton is a, again, a similar um, framework with an objective function using the exact Hessian. Well, again, it doesn't have to be exact Hessian, but the sort of the, the, the whole point is to use something very close to the Hessian here. And then um, the step size parameter is sitting here with the cubic regularization term. And again, you minimize this uh, to obtain your step to so some, in some sense, you minimize it and then you check the reduction condition. Okay, I know that there are quite a few people in the audience that are better experts at all these methods than I am. So if you have any objections, uh, please. You know, share them. I'm going to open the chat in case there. Sorry, I didn't have the chat open yet. Okay, but also just feel free to speak up. And the basically the, the the kind of the two situations that can happen: the successful and unsuccessful step can be illustrated in a very simple way. That either you so here in red we have the function, and in blue we have the model. And uh, basically, if we have uh, the good reduction in the function compared to the model, we this is called a successful step. Here is a situation where uh, the reduction in the model is not indicative of the reduction in the function. The reduction in the function is small or non-existent. And so we actually should be cutting our step uh, shorter. And that's why we reduce the step and call this iteration unsuccessful. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, what happens basically, so what are the kind of the questions in the analysis that we are trying to answer? So first of all, if we have a standard gradient descent, these are just kind of giving you intuition what we're after. So first of all, why adaptive method? So we, we can, uh, when we're analyzing a method such as gradient descent, we know that if this step size parameter is smaller than one over L, where L eclipse is constant of the gradient, uh, then the method always works. And indeed, there is a vast amount of literature where this is just assumed. You assume you can pick this step size small enough, and then you, know, you analyze your complexity based on that. Uh, in practice, we like to choose our step size parameter adaptively, because really, this is kind of a pessimistic estimate. So you can pick it depending on your local Lipschitz constant, which you don't necessarily know. Another reason for us, more important one, is that we're not using gradients here. And if we don't use a gradient, but some kind of direction GK, which is an approximation of the gradient, then this bound on alpha K is not really one over L, it's something else that depends on how good this approximation is. 
and that can be harder to determine. You know that there's a bond, but you, it's harder to determine what it is. So it's a little bit harder to use uh, predetermined step sizes in the case of an exact gradient. But more importantly, our inexact gradients that we're interested in, they're not necessarily inexact deterministically or other, <laughs> they, they're not deterministic gradients. So what does this mean? Uh, so there is a stochastic gradient setting where all you know is that your estimate of the gradient is just an unbiased estimate and there's not much you can do about it. We are trying to do something a little bit more sort of robust. Uh, we're trying to look at cases when your GK, which is the estimate of the gradient, is really meant to be a descent direction. So it's not an unbiased estimate by itself. It's just, it's a better, it's a better estimate. It's a good estimate, but it's still stochastic. So uh, what we wanted is say to be, for example, a descent direction, uh, but uh, we can't guarantee it all the time. So this is one condition. That's not necessarily, it's just an example of a condition which will guarantee that GK is a descent direction if theta is less than one. Uh, and this condition can be made to hold, for example, in certain cases, but only with probability one minus delta. So in this case, what kind of convergence can we have? So we know we have a descent direction, we're, uh, but, but not all the time, right? So every time we are kind of flipping a coin and but we don't know in advance whether this is a descent direction, right? There's no way to check. We just know it will be a descent direction with high probability. So one way in a very traditional way of kind of doing the analysis is saying, well, look, so how many iterations do we need to converge? It's a gradient descent algorithm. So until we get the gradient below epsilon, we need roughly this many iteration until we converge. So if each iteration has a high probability of having a descent direction, then basically in, with this probability total, we are going to converge to an epsilon uh, accuracy after you know, one of our epsilon squared iterations, because basically we're just assuming that on each iteration, nothing goes wrong. And that's fine in, in general, uh, but it, it's kind of unsatisfactory because it really certainly does not give us an analysis of what happens even if one iteration fails. So if one iteration fails, is like the algorithm gonna fail entirely or is still gonna recover somehow? So this is where we are, our analysis comes in. We're trying to analyze the situation with all these potential failures in mind. And as we will see, we actually allow, so this probability doesn't have to be even very high in many cases. Uh, so the, this uh, probability of satisfying some good conditions is not, um, sometimes can be quite low um, and, and the algorithm can still work. Okay, so, uh, so what are these requirements? So here I'm gonna list these requirements very high level kind of just as intuition because it really depends on the method and the situation and uh, you know, what we really mean. But in general, for whenever we're doing the analysis of um, convergence of say line search or cubic regularization, cubic regularized Newton or thrust region, we rely on the fact that even if we don't have, so we have a model here, which does not have necessarily exact gradient, exact Hessian, uh, this should be HK, sorry. And uh, even not necessarily exact function value. We have a question, Katya. Yes, sure. Can, can you oh, see the, the uh, chat? Uh, it is not the center. I said this way. Uh, yeah, it's not Okay, I'm sorry. I need to think about it. I don't know. Does, does it not really satisfy? Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes, okay, right. Um, okay, right, uh, sorry, yes. I mean, I, we can talk offline about the conditions because that condition, we have a whole paper on that condition, but, uh, and, uh, but, right, I just, um, uh, as I'm saying here, I'm gonna write a very general situation. Uh, and, you know, yeah. I mean, there's a, it's important to discuss what conditions apply where and how we how we can even enforce them. But um, 
Okay, so uh, what are these conditions? So this is basically says, if, even if I don't have F, G or H exact, uh, I want to make sure that they're sufficiently accurate. And what is sufficiently accurate? Essentially, and this is something that we've been kind of noticing from back from derivative free optimization work with Philippe and Andy years ago, um, is that what we need is kind of like the Taylor-like behavior. So basically that means that if we're trying to take a step, so this S is an unknown quantity right now in some sense, it's, it's a strange thing, right? I'm writing a model depending on S and I put S here as conditions on uh, the, the, the model. So that, that's what I mean by hand waving. But what I'm trying to say here is that if we're trying to make a step of a certain length, then we better have this accuracy in the function values gradients and the Hessian. So here, first order conditions means that Hessian just has to be bounded. I put a zero here. So there's no really dependency on the step size, but, um, but this basically gradient has to be norm proportional to the step size and the function values somehow step size squared. So when my steps are smaller, these things should be sufficiently accurate. If I want second order accuracy, then I go to the second order kind of top Taylor approximation. Okay. Uh, so, right. So now this is important. I'm going to talk about, so the, the, what has been done already, but I'll kind of repeat so that we get the intuition is the first case when all these conditions just hold deterministically, okay? So this is in exactness conditions on, and there's many algorithms analyzed under conditions of an exact gradient and exact Hessian. And it just, the condition says the, the gradient Hessian, whatever have to be, um, you know, accurate deterministically up to some, you know, order up to some bound. Now, uh, uh, we can also have a condition when conditions on F hold deterministically, but on G and H, they hold with some probability. What does this mean? So either F is computed exactly, the function values, or with some error, but this error is deterministically bounded, okay? Uh, however, G and H are some random approximations of Hessian and gradients, and there are you know, various situations where this is the case. Um, and finally, and this will be so, so this will be our case one, this will be our case two, and this will be our case three. And case three is when all F, G, and H are stochastic, and therefore all these conditions can all be ensured with some probability, but not deterministically. And what we're trying to do is to show that the analysis uh, encounter, I mean, can count the possibilities of basically these conditions failing. Any questions? All right, so uh, to set the stage, we, we're going to basically describe the analysis of the deterministic case, which is, you know, completely, you know, again, very high level, very straightforward, uh, but in the terminology that I will use then for stochastic case. So for each, situation for each algorithm, even you know, convex and non-convex, we can have some kind of a measure of progress towards optimality. So in each iteration, and think of it as just a function value for now. So this is going to be a function value that goes down on each iteration. Then there's an indic indicator which says uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the iteration is successful or not. So WK is one when the iteration is successful, WK is minus one when it's not. And then our step size parameter, I base this very simple rule that uh, the next step, 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 the next step size parameter is gamma times W to the power of WK uh, alpha K. So uh, iteration is successful, you multiply by gamma, iteration is unsuccessful, you divide by gamma. Um, and, then, uh, and then we have this concept of a stopping time, which is the first iterate which reaches epsilon convergence criteria, whatever it is. And in different situations, it's different things. So it can be gradient below epsilon, a function gap uh, to optimality, below optimality gap is below epsilon or something else, okay? Uh, 
So uh, we have the following conditions that actually hold for all of our methods. And it's easy to show, but it maybe takes some time. So these are the conditions. And that's what where the convergence comes from, convergence analysis. So for this alpha k, there's a threshold. Uh, we call it alpha underscore epsilon because it may depend on epsilon. Uh, so there's this threshold that says that whenever I'm below that threshold, I always have a successful iteration. So basically it says if my stop size is short enough, I'm guaranteed to make a step. That's how we guarantee convergence in these methods. Uh, and then basically whenever I have successful iteration, I reduce my function or my whatever this uh, criterion towards convergence by a fixed function of the step size parameter. Okay. So this is basically, if this is some kind of a constant. This can be epsilon squared times that constant, for example, or in trust region, this thing would be actually some constant times epsilon squared. And this function again would be epsilon squared. And so, it is quite obvious that if we are basically, if we have successful iterations, um, sorry, um, if, if, yeah, if uh, we guarantee successful iteration whenever alpha k is small enough, and on each successful iteration we have uh, this, then basically the total number of iterations is, uh, there should be plus a constant here, which depends on you know, where you start, it's not a very big deal, but essentially this is a very simple thing. So you start somewhere and on each successful iteration, you reduce by at least that much because the, you know, your you know, alpha does not go below this level. And each time your successful iteration decreased by this and you guaranteed successful iterations whenever your trust regions or step size parameters small enough, right? So that, that's how the convergence work. And then you plug in this. So this can be one of this can be epsilon squared. In some cases can be epsilon. It, it depends on uh, what you're trying to show. Okay. So, uh, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to show this uh, pictorially because we're going to return to this. Uh, so here I'm drawing this alpha k in terms of log, uh, just, you know, sort of to go up. So basically the, the, the step size, you can visualize it as going down and up, right? And so this is a unsuccessful step. This is a successful step, right? So this is unsuccessful, successful, successful, unsuccessful, unsuccessful, successful. So whenever it hits here, it will always be successful. So it cannot go below, below this level, okay? All right, so now we're going to look at the stochastic situation. So what changes in the stochastic situation? It's exactly the same as um, uh, the other framework deliberately put into the same kind of terminology, except for the local model here is now random. So there's no guarantee of uh, deterministic behavior for this model. And so are the estimates whenever we're doing the, um, rather whenever we're checking for sufficient degrees. So, these estimates are not exact, okay? And I'll remind you that in case two, there will be not exact, but deterministically sufficiently accurate. And in case three, they will be um, stochastic and uh, therefore not deterministically accurate, okay? Everything else is the same. All right, so what can happen in this case? So in case two, so these, Red triangles are the function estimates. They are not exact, but they're pretty good. The blue is the model as before. And so in a good situation, our model is sufficiently accurate, right? Uh, it's, it represents the function pretty well. And so we can have a successful step and decrease our function value. On the other hand, we can also have a completely inaccurate model because the model accuracy is only enforced in some probability. And so, <clears throat> with this probability delta, uh, we may go into opposite direction and therefore not obtain a good decrease in our function value and kind of have an unsuccessful step, even though, um, you know, the, and, and therefore reduce our step size, even though we're doing it for kind of bad reasons. Right. So what does that mean um, 
in our framework. So again, we are back to the same framework, except for now it makes sense because uh, this framework is now a stochastic process. So all these things are random quantities. The current progress towards the optimality is a uh, random quantity. The WK is a random quantity. It's um, uh, plus or minus one, depending on whether the iteration is successful or not, but it's, um, again, it's random, depends on the model quality. Um, the, therefore, the step size is a random quantity and the stopping time is a random quantity, okay? Uh, so we still will gonna, basically what we're gonna do now is we're going to put conditions on the stochastic process and under these conditions, we're going to have a bound on the expected, or actually even better than the expected, on, on basically high probability bound that we just recently derived on, on this quantity. But uh, the conditions that we had so far no longer hold. So then the previous conditions, we could just derive complexity immediately, but they no longer hold. What doesn't hold here? So in this case too, what doesn't hold is the following statement that Whenever we are hitting basically small enough, uh, there shouldn't be any gamma here, but whenever alpha k is small enough, then the iteration is guaranteed to be successful. Therefore, alpha k is never yet smaller than this uh, bar, um, than this threshold. That's no longer the case because things can go wrong and therefore we can cross and go over. And so this is the picture basically that we may have nice behavior as we did before above this threshold, but we can also go down, okay? And we can go down arbitrarily far. There is uh, with some small probability, we can keep on going down because things just keep going wrong. So how can we reword the condition and still get something that um, is satisfactory? Well. So simply, basically, and this is again going to be true for all our algorithms, is that this threshold here is no longer the absolute threshold. We can go below it, but once we go below it, we have a higher probability of going up than going down. Okay. So this is basically worded as this. So the, uh, the alpha k is greater or equal than gamma, blah, 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 whatever. But the w k has probability is probability one is. So it's, it's equal to one with probability one minus delta condition on the fact that alpha k is less or equal than uh, this threshold. So above the threshold, we don't necessarily care that there is more probability of going up and down, not necessarily, uh, but, but below this threshold. So there's an upward drift when we're below um, and maybe a downward drift when we're above. Okay, so basically now we have this uh, the, the, the situation and we here's the rough idea of the analysis. The analysis is kind of nice and simple and very combinatorial in a way. Um, so what happens? So we have these large steps and the small steps, right? And uh, so this is actually, I mean, we have various, very, variety of uh, different types of analysis of this uh, result, but kind of the cleanest version came out maybe like literally last few weeks with a couple of students at Cornell, uh, where we derived the, um, not just the expectation, but the high probability uh, result. And so this is, um, uh, this is the kind of the idea that we have. So again, the, the alpha k can go up and down, right? And what do we care about is that whenever it goes up, it's a successful step. So these steps are all successful, right? But on the other hand, uh, it's these steps, when they're successful, they are, and they have large alpha k, right? So remember, we're kind of trying to make sure that the decrease in the, in phi, in the, in the objective function, let's say, is somehow bounded away from zero by some constant. So it's a guaranteed decrease. And that's the guaranteed decrease we're seeking. And that guaranteed decrease happens on these steps. On these steps, the decrease may be smaller. So we may not know if it's good enough. So what happens is, and this is the logic of the proof, is that basically we can't have too many 
many steps like these. We cannot have too many steps that are large and successful and also have good models of the technical thing. So we cannot have too many steps like these because you know, each of them decreases the function value by a constant and the function value cannot decrease indefinitely. So we can bound the total number of steps like these. Okay, so that's the first step to complexity. And now to have the total complexity, we need to bound all the steps with respect to these steps. We basically need to show that the number of other steps cannot exceed constant times these steps. And why does that happen? So there are two kind of observations is that uh, basically for each step here that goes up, we will have, uh, or other, the other way around. For each step that goes down, we have steps that are going up except for just a constant number of steps that will just take us all the way down to this level. And then for these guys, for each step that goes up, we have a have to step, step that goes down. On the other hand, there are more steps going up than down because we have uh, this upward drift. We tend to go up. So this is very hand wavy, but basically putting it all together, we can bound in total the, the total number of steps with respect to number of these steps here. Okay, and this is basically kind of outlined uh, as the main ideas. And that gives us uh, the uh, results. So basically the theorem goes, so under these conditions on the stochastic process, which we just outlined, uh, we have the basically the bound on the total expected complexity. So this is the number of steps it takes to get to epsilon optimality. And uh, this is the bound. And moreover, this bound can hold in high probability. So this is a little bit uh, longer to parse, but basically it says that to exceed this sort of number of steps, uh, the, the, the probability is exponentially decaying in the number of steps, okay? And so what does this mean now? We can just go ahead and plug in, well, we have to show for every case and the you know, that our conditions hold. But if we show that the conditions of the stochastic process hold for each of the methods, we recover the complexity of, um, you know, for example, line search in non-convex case, convex case, and strongly convex case. So in non-convex case, one of epsilon square, one over epsilon in the convex case, and one over log epsilon in strongly convex case. And Everything is pretty much the same as in the deterministic case, except for this constant. And this constant is the probability dependent constant. So if we have a uh, delta here, which is zero, we have a deterministic method, which means we never fail to satisfy our conditions. And then this disappears. And if delta is approaching one half, so we basically have half time failures, half time uh, success then we, this is approaching infinity. So, you know, we may never converge. Um, and in fact, there is, you know, with a few changes to how you adapt the alpha K, you can allow this delta K to be not even bigger than half, but you can allow it to be much smaller than this. But the point is that still the analysis here works on the basically nearly half the time uh, failures of the conditions on the models. So that's pretty um, loose. And we have, again, the same recovery for trust region uh, and regularized Newton. So for trust region for first order, we have appropriate convergence result for second order. We have appropriate convergence result. And, and for typically regularized Newton, we also have the dependence that we should. And it all just really falls into the same framework. We just need to show that the conditions hold. Um, Okay, any questions? We're gonna embark on case three and I'm gonna cover it relatively quickly. So if there I have questions. a question, Katya. Mm -hmm. so, so is this constant sharp one over y minus two delta? Uh, I believe so. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's obvious, uh, but 
I mean, yeah, we haven't maybe explicitly shown it, but uh, but it, but it must be sharp. Okay. I can't imagine, you know, how it can be better. So we actually, in some cases, in the previous analysis, we had square here. That was not sharp. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, if there are no more questions, we'll move on to three. So yeah, so case three, that's where I do think we can improve our current results. I'll show them kind of, you know, vaguely, but there's a lot of, and there's a lot of work by, you know, other people also partially in the audience on the purely stochastic cases. They're much more messy in various ways. And I think some, you know, it depends what conditions you put in and, um, you know, I think we can um, really work on these and improve these in various ways. Okay, so what is the difference uh, with, when we have random function values is that we have this additional case uh, when the function values are completely inaccurate, right? So it's, we, we can allow this with some probability, maybe a small probability, but it can happen. So here are the two cases. So one case is we have a good model and a good step and we should take the step, but we don't because uh, the, you know, we, these are the estimates of my function and they tell me function is going up when in fact it's going down. That is in general, okay, because nothing bad happens. We're just missing a good opportunity to take the step here. Uh, still has to be accounted for. And there's another case when we actually have both the bad model and the bad function values, and we're taking a step which incre increases our objective function without us meaning to. And because we're increasing this objective function, it means that we no longer can have the kind of one of the conditions in this condition one, which we before were taking for granted. And so back to the all the conditions. So this is again our stochastic process, nothing changes here, all the same thing are defined as before. And here how we we're phrasing condition one for case two. Uh, and we still were assuming that whenever iteration is successful, we have this kind of guaranteed decrease. But we no longer can have this because we don't really, we, we may actually have an increase in the objective function. It's here, it really depends on what kind of conditions we put on the function estimates. But we allow them to be arbitrarily bad. Um, it is really very difficult to say anything about this. Well, but it depends on, so in trust region case, actually uh, we, we can say a lot stronger things, even if we allow function values to be arbitrarily bad. Um, I will, you know, leave it to kind of details if you are interested in discussing it later offline. Uh, but the overall condition that we <clears throat> decided to impose for now at least is simply that we have a function, sorry, not a function. So phi all of a sudden is no longer a function, but indeed is some kind of measure of progress. So in all the work that we're doing currently on the stochastic cases, phi is really a Lapuna function or a potential function. And so it, it decreases not only on successful iterations, but on unsuccessful iterations too, because it makes the analysis a lot easier. Uh, so it kind of encompasses what happens on each iteration. Uh, and it, it is bounded from below by zero. So it's not allowed to go down uh, infinitely. And the idea is that on each iteration in expectation, it is decreased by some function that's dependent on the current value of the step size parameter, which again can be very, very small, but hopefully will be large enough, often enough, so we can bound in total the number of um, steps that we need to until this can no longer be reduced. Okay, and so here is the uh, the kind of the general idea and then the results. Uh, so, okay, yeah, uh, what do I want to say? So basically we have this condition, uh, which basically means that this phi k is a, a sub-martingale, super-martingale. Uh, and Basically, we know that the total number of reductions that we can possibly have in expectation uh, is bounded because we cannot go below zero. So <clears throat> it's bounded from where we started from. So th if this thing is bounded, all we need to do to bound the expected uh, value of this is to apply Wald's identity, which basically allows us to kind of take 
apply expectation to this and, and, and uh, kind of separate this an expectation on the number of steps times the expectation here. Okay, and it's a little bit cumbersome because there are you know, certain things that need to be shown, but the same ideas work. We basically work, use the fact that you know, our alpha K process has an upward drift when it becomes small. So it keeps on returning to the same threshold as before. And every time we're at that threshold, in expectation, we reduce our phi K by a certain amount, which is alpha H of alpha bar. So it's a fixed amount and therefore, Overall, we are going to be deducing, um, uh, sorry, overall we can bound the number of such steps where this reduction happens and number of such steps is a constant of the number of total steps. Therefore, we can bound the number of total steps. And this is the result here. So it's very similar to what we had before. There should be big O here. There are different, well, I mean, we can hide this big O in, in the H actually. Uh, so this doesn't have to be, obviously we can just make it one. So it's going to be the same thing as before, but uh, the, the Delta here in different cases actually needs to satisfy more complicated conditions. So it's not just anything bigger than two, but it will be bigger than one hour two. Um, and that's in every particular case, just to ensure that we have this. So I'm not going to go into details of that, but uh, but so the things are just in general more messy. Uh, but we, nevertheless, we can still have convergence results for basically just about everything uh, that we've talked about before, except for one last case. So in trust region, uh, this is just to, to give you an idea. Some of you have definitely seen it before. What is the potential function? What is uh, the stopping criteria? And what is the result? So if we have the potential function um, for trust region, it's basically a combination of function decrease or you know, function value and the step size <clears throat> uh, parameter or the trust region radius. So here you can see how we can show that on every iteration we have a reduction. Because if we have a successful iteration, then this reduces. If we have unsuccessful iteration, then this reduces. And so by balancing these two objectives out, we can ensure that on every iteration it reduces the next iteration. And then we have uh, the, the standard stopping criterion. And then again, we have the convergence with the rate one of epsilon squared, which is what's expected. Uh, for second order, we can do the same thing. We just modify the objective, the, the phi a little bit, and we'd have different criteria convergence criteria because second order method. So we converge to a station to a second order stationary point and we have this following convergence result. Then uh, line search, line search, we have a much more messy uh, level of function for various reasons. Uh, but nevertheless, we, you know, putting things, different things together. There's some extra parameter here that we adjust in the algorithm. Uh, we were able to recover the convergence rate of the line search. Pretty much the L cube is kind of really not optimal and not, not tight, but um, it's an artifact of the proof. Um, in the convex case, uh, so you haven't seen it, it's, it's interesting because in the convex case, basically, all you need to do is to come up with a slightly modified, so you, you take this definite function and then from that, you build another Lepinov function uh, like this. And then you just apply analysis to this function and uh, it all just works out without almost any additional work uh, for convex case. And that's how we get the convex uh, case convergence of one over epsilon. And the same thing happens with the strongly convex case. Again, we just design this Lepinov function and take the, uh, a new one, which is, you know, the, the difference of the logs where you're trying to achieve conversion, basically where you can't get, and then you can have the, um, the other. Uh, but what is the role of this constant you had in the in psi k before and also in this one? So not depending uh, on k? Not this. So, right. so, so this is, this is basically, this is this, um, okay, let me go back for a second. So uh, the phi k is the progress uh, towards optimality, right? Okay. 
Right. So now in the convex cases, what I do is I plug in psi k here. So mm -hmm. I design phi k and then derive psi k out of phi k and plug it in here. And then this condition holds for psi. Okay. And then I can apply the theory. Okay. But but still, so you so in, in the on the on the okay on the other slide you had a constant minus one over oh okay k. yeah yeah well, just, what is the role of, of the constant uh so it's uh, to keep it first of all non-negative oh, okay good. okay uh yeah and uh yeah. I think just non-negative yeah okay it cannot be zero right um yeah if it's going right yeah to keep it non-negative okay. yeah thank you Okay, well, uh, and so finally, uh, this is something that we kind of got stuck at and then had to go back and re-examine for a while our methodologies, but I do believe we have kind of some ways forward with this. Um, and that's the cubically regularized Newton. Uh, so the problem is that you cannot, so, you would think that it should the theory should apply straightforwardly there because what happens with a cubically regularized Newton is just your reduction in the in each iteration is epsilon to three over two instead of uh, epsilon squared. So that's where you get your convergence. The only problem is that uh, the, the definition of this um, uh, T epsilon is that the kind of the next, the um, the gradient of the next iterate is below epsilon. So the reduction in your current iterate depends on the gradient at the next iterate. And that doesn't give you a stopping time by definition of stochastic processes. And you cannot use the Wald's equation, not directly at least. And so the framework does not apply as is. We do believe that under relatively small modifications, we can, so changing the definition of a stopping time and changing conditions uh, one to some degree, we can still apply theory, just we need to redesign these conditions a little bit. But so we're currently in the process of doing that. And there's a whole bunch of other things that we can do. So basically what, what's our conclusion? We have this, um, framework, which uh, we've been working on for a while, but I, I mean, I believe we can keep on improving it and apply it to more and more settings. It certainly takes into account a true behavior of an algorithm in a sense that the algorithm is allowed to fail. And then it, the analysis shows that under these failures, I mean, not algorithm, but iterations are allowed to fail, but the algorithms can recover. And so it analyzes basically robustness of algorithms with respect to these failures. Uh, and uh, that that's nice, and I think we should keep doing, you know, keep keeping these things, this kind of analysis in mind. Uh, but the analysis itself can be improved. Uh, so there's no high probability results yet for stochastic cases. I do believe that they're possible. Uh, I mean, they have to be very possible because it just kind of be very intuitive that there would be high probability uh, results, not just expected expectation results, but um, you know, we may need to redesign some of the analysis a bit. Um, stochastic case, each of this, these cases that I showed you is analyzed under, you know, some assumptions that I think we can drop, but we need to work on that. And then finally, this, uh, yeah, stochastically regularized Newton or optimal trust region, which is the trust region version uh, by, you know, Frank Curtis and um, uh, Daniel Robinson and others. Uh, with also optimal complexity. So that's another algorithm that we can incorporate into this framework. Um, and with that, uh, there are some papers that are listed here. There are some others. There are also some others in preparation. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for the nice talk. So are there any questions? So Jonathan Eckstein has a question. What is the practical application? Yeah, right. Okay, so uh, one thing is, is a black box optimization. Uh, the, uh, there's a lot of work right now where, where the Hessian, well, Hessian less so, but gradient are estimated in the, with the randomized finite differences. 
uh, which gives you basically certain approximation of the gradient that is accurate, but only with some probability. And exactly has the conditions like it's the descent direction with some probability depending on what you want. Uh, but the function values are there. So they, be, they can be noisy, so you can have actually some bounded noise, but they're not stochastic. That's one. The, the, the actually, the original reason we started looking at these um, kind of conditions was uh, again, black box functions when we were trying to estimate sparse Hessians. Uh, so let's say your Hessian is sparse and you can build your Hessian by interpolation, but uh, you don't want to, you know, have too many interpolation points and you know your Hessian is sparse. You just don't know the sparsity, sparsity pattern, pattern. Then you can use basically um, uh, results from compressed sensing, but then you need to sample. So you, your function values, the, these points are sampled randomly. And if they're sampled randomly, then again, what you recover from them is, is, uh, is uh, not exact, okay? Uh, so, th I mean, these are, basically many applications when you're recovering a gradient in Hessian from some kind of um, approximation that is just not guaranteed to be uh, deterministic. And you actually don't even necessarily have bounds on what happens when you don't get sufficient accuracy. The accuracy holds with some probability, otherwise you don't know. Um, other cases is when you're computing your gradients in parallel and uh, you, you, you have like a faulty, you know, it's called Byzantium, Byzantium machine, right? Um, and so you can have uh, basically some outliers in your, um, I mean, computer gradients in parallel by aggregating a lot of sums, right? And then you can have some failures and that's another possibility. Now, in this case, it's a question what happens with the function values, but um, let's say it's just the gradient computation that fails, yeah. Thank you. Kiatani, satisfied with the answer? Are there further questions? Yura? Yeah, can I ask? Uh, are there any situations where we know that the condition we impose holds? Like in the, in the, the first condition, like the simple one? Uh, are you talking about. Uh... So we. we we, 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 in, in, in the stochastic settings, we still assume some condition holds. There is a bit different from the deterministic case. So you, sorry, and are you talking about like here? Uh, even in the, sim, the, in the simpler case, no, probably here as well, but this is more complicated, so, so at least. No, no, but the point is that, okay, so we show, I mean, this is how we get the convergence results for all these methods, is that we show that this condition holds for all these methods. Right, so in the simpler cases, as, as, as you say, uh, so basically if we have exact function values, right? Uh, so this was the condition uh, with the exact function, that case two, right? Um, where did we put this? Well, uh, so in case two, basically we, we had, okay, I didn't put it, right? I, I put this condition and then replaced it with this, but basically, um, that's exactly right. It holds for all, it holds for line search, it holds for trust region, it holds for uh, cubic regularized Newton. Every time it holds without basically almost any modification to the algorithms, if we have exact function values, or if we have uh, inexact function values and their, their inexactness is bounded, deterministic, then again, these conditions hold for all these methods, but until we converge to some neighborhood of the solution, otherwise things start to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, for the, the, this most, the, the, the stochastic one, that's the whole kind of point of, um, you know, that's why we have to write a lot of papers about it is that each time it takes work to show this condition holds for a particular method. And for that, to, to show that, you may need to modify the method a, a little bit or impose some conditions. And more importantly, what you need to do is to, uh, so how do you show these conditions hold? You show it from the conditions on the models. Basically you're, uh, let me, because this is, yeah, this is quite important. So let me go back to this. I started with these conditions. I didn't specify really what, what this means, 
because the S is the step size. This was not very specific, but in every specific algorithm, you have to write down what are the conditions on the models. They call this probability one minus delta, but what are they exactly? So there's no the step size here. It's usually something else. It's like uh, the alpha K times maybe the norm of gradient, or it's the uh, trust region radius here or something like this that you actually know, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you show that the conditions hold, uh, condition one holds for a particular method. Okay, so we, trust, we translate this condition from the method to the model. And in the end, we show that this condition holds for this particular model. Well, for this method with these particular, yeah, with these kind of models, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So each method, so there's a method and there's a model, right? So models have to satisfy some conditions uh, and you can specify these conditions a bit more. And then the methods are different, right? There's a trust region, there's line search. So whenever I um, describe a method, sorry, uh, whenever I describe the method, there are various ways of um, computing the step here, checking the uh, checking the pattern, and maybe even as the, there may be some other requirements set up here. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. For the, for the questions. Yeah. So, does traditional finite sum machine learning satisfy the one minus delta condition? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. That was our kind of the main. Uh, you just need to sample sufficiently. So this is uh, right. Uh, so this is kind of, yeah, without this wouldn't make any sense to talk about this work. Um, so uh, of course you cannot use, again, you cannot use S because S is a known quantity, but let's say you talk about trust region. In trust region, the, the, the step size is bounded by the trust region radius. So you can just plug in trust region radius here. And all you need is that the gradient GK minus the true gradient uh, norm is bounded by the size of the trust region. Now, you do need to know the variance of your, um, you know, machine learning, uh, basically individual gradients, right? So you, you, you have this huge sum, but you can sample out of that sum a sufficient number of samples so that uh, and average them out so that the, basically the, 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 the mini batch gradient, the size of the batch has to be sufficient to satisfy this condition. And you can just basically derive the size of the mini batch, which will satisfy this condition if you know the variance overall of your stochastic gradient estimate. Is that clear? Thank you. Yeah, and and then and then it and then it extends to the more to general case, not when it's a finite sum, but when it's a true expectation. So, like from machine learning to the fact that we're trying to optimize the expected value, not actually the sum. It just extends naturally to that same way. Okay, thank you. Are there further questions? So then I have two questions, uh, Katya. So in 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 all three conditions, so the the second, the second statement or the second item was a decreasing property expressed in terms of a function age. And you are just uh, asking for existence. Okay, can you get the function age and like a formula for age or, or, ju or you just know that it exists? No, no, uh, okay. So that age dictates the convergence uh, speed, right? I mean, rate of convergence, yes. absolutely, right. So of course, for every specific case, um, mm -hmm. I may not have actually, written it out, but I thought I might have uh, in a very specific case. Ah, uh, no, I did not. Right. I should have written out what H is on every specific case. But for example, here, H is epsilon cube. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, it's const constant time epsilon cube, right? And here it will be constant times epsilon square. Okay. Or it's H is actually epsilon square times alpha K and alpha K is bounded by a constant. Oh, so okay. it's very constant. And, and the, the, the second question is, so are, are there some, some algorithms like, like let's say a quasi Newton method or you know, something else for which uh, yeah, the conditions are not fulfilled? So we can, for which you, can, you cannot guarantee or can you can show that they, they are fulfilled? So, well, with quasi Newton, I mean, in general, it's, I think, yeah, it depends. Uh, so the local convergence side we haven't looked at uh, because mm -hmm. that's interesting, you know, uh, so, I would say that not all 
analysis, convergence analysis, are using these type of um, logic. So, for okay. example, uh, accelerated accelerated uh, method for convex case inertia the, method. Yeah. yeah, the the, the yeah. analysis that the way it works is not based on the reduction on every particular step. It's based on the accumulated total Indeed. reduction. And I don't know how to use this logic there. Okay. It doesn't mean that it doesn't say it's not satisfied. I just don't know how to do it with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So then we can stop here. So thank you very much for a great talk and yeah, for a nice discussion. Thank so you. So we will post the, the video and the, the slides on, on our website.